You know, I really love this kind of work, honestly. I, I love uh, immersing in worlds that I don't normally see. Um, some, a lot of times these worlds are, are not pretty, they're difficult, they're not uh, easy to be in. It's not easy to be in a prison day after day um, for, for months. Um, that, it, it, is, it is challenging. The militia movement started in America in the 1990s under President Bill Clinton. Uh, there were a lot of right-wing groups that were started to become afraid that the federal government was going to take away their guns, their right to, to bear arms, which uh, has been a right in the United States since the country was founded. And um, so these, these groups start organizing and doing paramilitary training uh, with weapons as basically saying that if the government tries to take their weapons, they'll fight. Um, this movement after Bill Clinton uh, kind of died out, and when Barack Obama was elected president, the first black president of the United States, the number of these groups exploded. Uh, there were about 300 of these militias in the United States. Mostly, mostly most of these people are kind of working class Americans. Um, a lot of former military people uh, are involved in them. Um, uh, a lot of kind of, you know, uh, paranoid um, ideology. Uh, and at the time that I was uh, reporting on these groups, this is before Donald Trump was, was elected president, they were, um, they were, were an anti-government group. They were basically against the federal government and they were uh, preparing for uh, some disaster that they thought was gonna come, that the government was gonna bring on them. And some of these groups uh, also patrolled the, the border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, so I joined these groups uh, as a member, uh, undercover, and uh, actually went to the border where they set up sort of a military base in the desert and look for immigrants trying to enter the country and uh, they try to stop them. The issue of whether militias are legal is debatable in the United States. Uh, it's legal to have weapons. Um, it's legal to shoot with other people. Um, the, there are some laws against paramilitary training, uh, but these have never been enforced against these groups. There are some, you know, a lot of them, like I said, are uh, themselves were soldiers. Uh, some of them have been in law enforcement themselves. Um, they operate in many ways outside the law. When they're patrolling the border, for example, they're just going, they're just private citizens going on their own uh, trying to find people. Uh, but what I saw there was that the, the federal border patrol was interacting a lot with these militias and uh, I actually saw a, a border patrol agent who said that he was an intelligence officer for the border patrol um, giving intelligence, giving information to the militias, uh, telling us where to go to find people crossing the border. So they were essentially using the militia as a kind of extra force uh, that was unpaid to go out um, you know, and kind of patrol the, the desert. So I'd been uh, reporting on prisons for several years in the United States. Um, the United States has the largest prison population in the entire world. There's more than two million people behind bars uh, in the United States. And uh, a slice of that population are in private prisons. About 8% of the people are in prisons that are run by companies. They're for profit. And these, these private prisons are very difficult to, to get access to. It's very difficult to see what's happening inside of them um, because you know, in America we have some laws giving us the right to, to access to certain information from any government agency like a, a prison. Uh, but that does not apply to, to private companies. So it's very difficult to, to get information about what's happening inside. So I had the idea to apply for a job as a prison guard to get inside and see what was happening. So I just went on the, the website of this company, filled out an application. I didn't lie in my application. I said my name, I said where I worked, and um, I sent it to several prisons, and 
within uh, a couple of weeks, I was getting phone calls and interviews and uh, had several job offers. And uh, when in these interviews, they, they didn't ask me why I wanted to work in a prison. They didn't ask me about anything about my job experience. It was clear they were really desperate you know, for, for employees. Uh, the job paid $9 an hour, um, which is uh, very low. And um, so I got several offers for jobs. I decided to, to go work in Louisiana, and I moved down there and uh, did a month of training. Um, and then worked in the prison for, for three months. Private companies control about 8% of the prison population. So in many ways, this isn't a lot. Um, but the issue is that uh, for the people in these prisons that are run by private companies, the conditions are, are worse. Conditions in Amer all American prisons are bad. Um, but in the, these private prisons, uh, the company is trying to make a profit. It's a company. So uh, to do that, they have to cut corners. They pay their, their guards less. Uh, they uh, cut medical costs. Um, they cut staff. So for example, I was working in a, a unit with 350 prisoners, and the only, uh, it was only me and one other guard interacting with all those prisoners. Um, so it was very violent. It was more violent than public prisons. Um, and these companies also, uh, they lobby, you know, they, they lobby the government uh, trying to influence laws um, that, you know, might uh, impact how many people go to prison. Uh, they also run a lot of immigrant detention. Private companies run uh, about half of the immigrant detention centers. So they have much more um, influence in some ways in, in the, the immigrant detention issue. Um, and it's a similar, similar problem where they're, tr they're trying to cut costs so the conditions are, there's always uh, arising issues of, of conditions in these prisons. Uh, they often have riots because uh, people, you know, are protesting for better food, for better medical care, et cetera. You know, what I learned when I was, when I was working in the prison undercover is that, you know, it's not just that you go inside and you're just some kind of eyes in the situation seeing what's happening. You, you become part of the situation. That's unavoidable. And uh, I was working a job there. You know, I was a guard. I had to do the job. Um, and that job started to really affect me. And um, I saw myself becoming kind of more hardened, uh, more authoritarian in some ways. Uh, which you know I didn't expect, and uh, the more I was there, the more energy I was putting into the, my job as a prison guard rather than my job as a journalist. Um, you know, you just kind of um, you become part of that world. In some ways, you you lose yourself in in that world, um, and you always have to be aware of that. You know, you have to um, not. You have to walk a line where, where you have to be a part of the situation you're in, but you also need to be always observing what's happening, including to yourself.